But you know, I want to talk about family today. Family. I am so blessed to be in two families. And I know what you're thinking immediately. Yeah, you're in a second marriage, so you got two families. No, I count that as one family. <laughs> you know, uh, we don't talk about her kids and my kids. They're our kids. They're not her grandkids and my grandkids. They're our grandkids. We don't have any great ones yet, but they will be our great-grandkids. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the fact that I am blessed that, that I, have, I have my family, my biological, my, my earthly family, and I have my church family. Amen? I have two families, two families. My church family is a spiritual family, not the physical one. And uh, there are so many wonderful things about family. I mean, if I were to say to you, what are some of the traits or characteristics of the family? A few things that may come to mind if I were to ask you, what, what do you think of when family happens? Uh, some of the things that might come up into your mind is that, first of all, the point here is you're born into your family. <laughs> Did you ever notice you don't get to pick your parents? I guess God had a reason for that. Yeah, I, I, I had, I'm sorry for the rest of you, but I had the very best parents on the planet Earth ever. They were godly Christians, you know. They, they took us to church uh, every time the church doors were open. I mean, we were, I, I lived at church. I, I, I knew everybody in the church. I was just a kid. You know, even though I was so young that I would, after church, my brother and I would race, you know, crawling underneath the pews from the front to the back, you know. But we, I had a church family. Um, my parents, uh, I didn't get to pick them, and I would not have picked anyone other than them. I, I had the most godly mom, and they were just so practical, down-to-earth, middle-class people. The second thing is, you know, that you're, you're born into your family, you don't get to pick it. And that comes to mind when you think of a family. In fact, a married couple, I suppose they're a family, but they always talk about when are you going to start a family, which means you really, nobody views you as a family until you have a child in the family, right? And that's when you become a family. And, and notice the second thing I, I kind of notice about families is you receive the name of your family. You know, I'm a Henderson because my dad was a Henderson, whose dad was a Henderson, who was a Henderson. Now, I know they're hyphenating names today, like Schmidt. Schmidt marries Jingleheimer, and so you got Jingleheimer Schmidt. And then they have a kid, okay, marries Jacob, and then you have Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt, right? Because they keep hyphenating names. Then they marry a guy with John, and it becomes John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt, right? Normally, we don't do that. We, we, we take the name of the male in a relationship because it's constituted a new, new family, and you get your family name. And, you know, most of us are proud of our family names. And because uh, I can remember going to family picnics, and my cousin, um, his last name was Day, but we went to the Henderson family picnic, and it was like, who are you? I mean, he's my cousin. This is the Henderson family picnic. And then on my mom's side, it was the Roth picnic. And everybody there had Roth's name, but we were the Hendersons. And so it, the name just, you get a name and it sticks with you. It's your name. It's your name. You receive that family name. Uh, the next thing that I notice is you have family resemblances. Even when it's a baby. Did you ever notice that? Who does it look like? And I say, it looks like a baby. <laughs> oh, no, no, it looks so much. It's got, it's got the father's eyes, and it's got, it's got the mother's nose. We have the, this resemblance to the family. Oh, the red hair. Where did that come from? We're all got brown hair. Well, in, our, in my family, the Hendersons, we all have brown eyes, brown hair, it seems. And then I have a cousin that popped up with red hair. Where did that come from? Well, now I have a grandson who has red hair. And then we look back through the genealogy, 
there is a recessive gene of red hair. So there's still family resemblance that's locked into the family's DNA somewhere. We, we resemble our family, right? That's true, that's true. Then you share with your family. You share the hopes and aspirations of the family. Uh, my son Jeremy, if I just said, well, you know, we're thinking about getting some ice cream. Woo! He said, so he's just thinking about getting ice cream after church. That was like a promise. You were locked in, so I couldn't, even, couldn't say that because he, was, he shared that hope. Man, we're going to have ice cream after church. And then if there wasn't any in the fridge, then he would say, you lied. Well, I said, we were thinking about it. That didn't count for anything, you see, because he was sharing in the hopes. If I say, hey, we're going to go to Disney World for Christmas vacation this year, kids, immediately they shared in the hope. We, we share in that same hope all as a family. And, and, and you do too. All, every family does that. We share in the hope with the family. You act like your family. All right? It comes down to simple things like everybody says, I walk funny. My brother, oldest brother, well, I walk like him. He walks funny. And he walks like my grandfather on my mom's side because he walked funny. You see what I'm saying? We have these, you act like, in a lot of ways we act like family. In so many ways we act like family. And you could probably think of even more ways that uh, things that come to mind when you think about the family. And I pick these because... Not only are they true in our physical family, but John says that they are traits, these traits are true also of your spiritual family. First of all, you are born into the family, the spiritual family. Now in 1 John chapter 3, we're back up one verse, two verses, 28 and 29 of the previous chapter, where we left off last week, and it said that, and now dear children, he's talking about family, got his kids, he says, Continue in him, Jesus Christ, so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. Jesus had promised, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to return to receive you so that you'll be where I'm, I'm going. You'll be with me. <clears throat> He's coming back. And if you know that he is righteous, and Jesus is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right is, has been born of him. He's talking about new birth here. You've had a new birth. In fact, Jesus in the Gospel of John tells us about the new birth. <clears throat> the rabbi Nicodemus, he's an elderly guy, and he comes to Jesus by night. Jesus is the upstart preacher. And he comes to Jesus by night because he's heard about Jesus' reputation of doing miracles. And he said, nobody can do the things you're doing except God is with him. And Jesus just looks him right in the eye and says, Nicodemus, I'm telling you the truth. You cannot see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. You need to be born again. As religious as Nicodemus was, he needed the new birth. You need to be born again. <laughs> Nicodemus I don't know about Nicodemus. Nicodemus says, come on, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born? <clears throat> now, that is not the question I would have asked because I know you can't do that. I would not have asked that question. I, said, I would have just said, what do you mean? What do you mean? I'm supposed to crawl back in the womb and pop right back out again? I mean, that just would not have popped into my mind. But Jesus said to him, because he went there, he said, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water, because he just brought up physical birth. Yes, you've got to be born physically, born of the water. That's what they say, the water bursts, then guess what comes next? The baby's born, all right. So, born of water and of the Spirit. You need to be born of the Spirit, Nicodemus. You need to have two families, not one. I don't know what Nicodemus' last name was. I didn't even know if they went by that, but he probably had his... Usually it was something like Bar Jonas, which Bar means son of Jonas. And so over what his dad's name is, they put Bar in the front of it, and so he would have been Bar, whatever it was. And he says here, 
You've got to be born, not just physically, but you've got to be born not of man also, but of the Spirit. You're not climbing back into the womb. You need to have a new birth from the Spirit of God. He says, you must be born again. You can't get to heaven without it. It's an absolute standard in truth. Jesus then says to him, uh, a little further down the passage, you see, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. That's why the weatherman just can't get it right. You don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. Only God knows that. And then this is what he adds. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. You do not know when the Spirit is going to work. I preach the Word of God every Sunday. And many Sundays I give an invitation at the end to just say right where you're at, you can pray and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior from your sins. And I don't know when the Holy Spirit is going to work in that life, infuse them with life so that they will believe. I don't know. I give the general call, but unless the Holy Spirit gives that efficacious call, that one that actually works, then uh, it's not going to happen. And so uh, because I, I'm just a man and I'm not the Spirit of God, I just preach the Word and the Holy Spirit at His time, His way, His method, He works in that person and He gives them life. Boom. It's not from my great intellect or my great convincing arguments or it's not because, it's only because I preach the Word, the Holy Spirit uses the Word to regenerate, to give new life in that person. So much so that it tells us in 1 John chapter 5, a couple chapters later, we'll see this when we get there, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ. So the moment, I was eight years old when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. At eight years old, I believed in Him. But the, this text says, that person has been born of God. When I believe, something happened before that I believed, and that was the Holy Spirit infused life in me. Because I know in the passage here, whoever believes is present tense, but has been born of God is past. It's in the perfect tense. And the perfect tense says, it happened, all right? It happened before. So if I accepted Christ here at this moment, before that, at some time before that, I was born again. And so that that new birth, the perfect tense means it happened in the past and the results are abiding. It's like when I had my original birthday years ago. See, I didn't give you the date. And so I had my birthday years ago, my physical birthday. I was born on that day, and my life has continued. I'm still I'm alive. Well, wait a second. Yeah, I'm still alive. I'm still alive ever since. And what are you saying? When you believe, it's only because God the Holy Spirit before that infused life into you, and your very first breath, you remember when the doctor smacked you on the bottom? No, you don't remember that. But you know he smacked you, and the first thing you did, you took a breath and you cried out. When the Holy Spirit regenerates and he, he makes you born again, it's kind of like he smacks you too, and you breathe out, and you believe, and you repent, and you're saved. It's just like that. Just like that. You've been previously born of God. And I was born into the family as an eight-year-old kid. Nicodemus, Nicodemus was an old man. Years ago, I was visiting on a, a family in a church. They were shut in, and it was the gal. Her husband was not a Christian. He was an ornery old farmer. I mean, ornery. Nobody in the community liked him. So I'd visit, and I went over to gospel with him, and I asked him if what I said made sense. And he said, oh, thanks, so... Okay, so then you, need, you, re, you realize that Jesus died for your sin? Yeah, I think so. And I said, well, that you're a sinner and you've got to accept Jesus as your Savior? Yeah, I think so. I said, so would you like to do that right now? Yeah, I think so. I, I picked up on, he never said yes or no to anything. It was, I think so, or I don't think so. I said, well, if you think so, <laughs> won't we pray right now, accept him? He said, well, I think so. 
And so we did. He prayed and accepted Christ as his Savior. He was the oldest person I ever led to the Lord. Guy was like in his 90s. Not much later, he broke his hip, went into a nursing home, said, I wanted to be baptized. Well, you know, I'm a Baptist. I have a Baptist church. We baptize by immersion. How am I going to get him to the tank? Now, the good news was our tank was in the floor. So it was up at the sanctuary in front of the church, right in the floor. You just took the stage up, and there it was. You know, you went down in. So, yeah, we could put him in a wheelchair, roll him in, and <laughs> duck him in. But I knew that wasn't going to fly. So we, we, we had to do it at the nursing home. And uh, they had a bathtub there, and uh, they had this, it, it was like a crane, you, a sling. You got in this thing, and you crank it up, and you swing the arm over, and you crank it down and put it in the water, and that's what we did. Now, we had to get attorneys to sign off on all of this and responsibility, and but we finally got it. We he got him in that thing. We cranked him up, swung him over, put him down in, so all that was out was his head. I baptized the head. And he became a member of the church. Listen, he accepted Christ. <clears throat> I did it at eight years old. He was like 90 years old. And, uh, but no matter how old you are, you have to have a second birth. If you don't have a second birth, you are not in the family of God. It's just that simple. You must be born again. Now, when you're born into the family of God, you're given a name. Now, we could talk about in the Revelation talks, he gives us a new name, but I want to talk about this name. How great is the love of the Father that is lavished on us. God, God loved us so much that he sent his son into the world. We could go to John 3, 16, a bunch of other verses. God loved us so much. But here he says that, he should, that we should be called the children of God. Whoa. For as many as received Jesus, he gave the authority to be called the children of God. He that I should be called the child of God. I'm a Christian. That's why I got the label there. Hello, I'm a Christian. A Christian. In the book of Acts, it says they were first called Christians in Antioch. In Antioch. Well, what were they called before that? Well, they called disciples. Or they were called the people of the way. What way? Well, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except through me. At eight years old, when the Holy Spirit regenerated me, he smacked me, and I believed in Jesus as my Savior, repented of my sins, I became a Christian, a follower of the way of Jesus. I am a Christian. Now, a Christian has also got the idea of, I'm a little Christ. I'm a little Christ. People should look at me. They should hear me. They should watch me and see Jesus changed my life because I'm a child of God. That's what I am. I am. So you resemble the family too. John turns at this point and says, dear friends, really the word is beloved. <laughs> Why this translation translated it friends is beyond me. It, it, it's dear loved ones, beloved, I love you. Dear loved ones, now we are the children of God. Holy Spirit made me born again, smacked me, I believed, and now I'm on the way. He said, children, you are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. Did you ever notice when a baby is born, you don't hand it the keys and say, hey, you drive home. They're a baby. <laughs> they can't drive. And so they're not what they're going to be. They're just a baby. I am not yet what I am going to be. Nor are you. You're not what you're going to be. You're going to be something so wonderful. Listen to what he says. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, ah, something miraculous is going to happen when Jesus comes back and he appears, the text says, we shall be like him. Oh, man. The best part of going to heaven is I will never, ever sin again. Amen? I'll never mess up again. That means my wife will never misunderstand me again. 
I'll get everything right the first time. Wow. We shall be like him. We're going to be glorified. Jesus was glorified in his glorified body. You can read the gospel accounts. He appeared in rooms without opening doors or windows. Boom, he was just there. And yet you could handle and touch his body. Uh, He was real. He could eat and he could drink. And and so he had this glorified body. And I'm going to have this super glorified body just like Jesus. You know what? My knee will not hurt and I won't need any opioids to stop it from hurting. It's going to be wonderful. It says, we shall see him as he is. Remember on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus was transfigured in all the glory that he was going to have in the future uh, as a resurrected Savior and and in his kingdom, and we're going to be just like him. The book of Daniel says in the resurrection, we will shine like the firmament forever and ever. We're going to have a glow. I'm going to radiate. I don't know if we get to pick colors of what we radiate, but we're going to radiate. I'm going to have... We're going to have a glow. You know, artists always put a little halo around Jesus so you know which one of the characters is Jesus when they draw him. Literally, we're going to glow. We're going to glow. We're going to have a body just like his. Now, as I go in this passage, uh, I, I find that you're going to share the family hope. And the family hope, the family hope, like, like kids having a hope going to Disneyland, we got this hope of going to heaven. The Bible calls this the blessed hope. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves. What? Because I know Jesus has been born in the family of God, he smacked me and I got the, the, the faith and, and I repented, I'm on the way, and, and I share in the family and the family hopes. I purify myself because I know that the obedient child is going to be rewarded. <laughs> even with my kids in Disneyland. If you kids are good, you know, for the 23-hour trip down there, (laughs) then we'll buy the fast track pass for you, but if not, you're going to have to stand in line for hours. (laughs) Yeah, you you see? And and, and there's, there's this reward at the end. He says, they purify themselves just as he is pure. And while we wait for that blessed... Right now we're waiting. We're not there. You know, we're on the 23-hour trip to Florida. We're at, to Disney World. To, we're, we're on that however many years we live trip to heaven and glory. He said, but while we wait for the blessed hope... What's the blessed hope? Jesus returns and the manifestation of the glory of the great, great God and Savior Jesus Christ. You notice what this passage is calling Jesus? Our great God. He's our great God and He's our Savior, Jesus Christ. In a couple of months, we're going to be celebrating Christmas, the first advent. This passage is celebrating the second advent, the second arrival of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, it says, Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. I've been in the nursery where they have a little sign above the changing table that says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. (laughs) It's not what this passage is referring to. Sleep here is die. So if you substitute this euphemism here, you substitute, we will not all die, but we will all be changed instantaneously. That's what he goes on to say. Because he says here, in a flash, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will all be changed. I don't know exactly how fast a flash is or the twinkle of the eye. I'm told that General Electric has actually timed how long it takes for that little twinkle to take place and it's like a millisecond. I mean that fast, boom! I am going to be changed. He said, not all will die. Some will be dead and they'll be changed too. He says, for the perishable will clothe itself with imperishable. That which is perishable is that which has died. As <laughs> soon as you die, your body starts to perish. It starts to disintegrate. It returns to dust. From dust you were created, dust you will return. He says, and he says, and the mortal will put on immortality. It's going to clothe itself. And if you take the metaphor here, it's like, The perishable, you know, the the skeleton, gets a new cloak put on it, clothing. 
It's clothed. That skeleton that's in the box, all right, it gets a whole new clothing put upon it that is imperishable, will last for all eternity. And the mortal, the mortal is that which is subject to death. That's what mortality, you're mortal, you're subject to death. It will put on immortality. What happens? It clothes right over you, right over me. If I'm alive at the time when Jesus returns, I'm going to be clothed over. Now, I don't know if you watch some of the Christian films where they depict the rapture, and there's always a puddle of clothing left. It's like they took off without their clothes. I don't know if that's going to happen that way or not, but I do know the text says you're going to be clothed over with a new body. I assume God can give you new clothes too. (laughs) When the rapture takes place, boom, in a twinkling of an eye, millisecond, you see, that's at the end. I was born again. I slapped with new faith. I have this faith. I have this walk. I'm living to please my Lord and Savior. At the end, he says, hey, it's time. I'm coming. Boom, there's a sound of the trumpet. And boom, everything has changed. And I am going to be a totally different person, glorified, body like Jesus. He says, then will be the saying that is written come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. See, you don't even have to get to the end of the Bible to know that we win. (laughs) It's right there in in 1 Corinthians, we win. Now, in 1 Thessalonians, he says, for the Lord himself will descend down from heaven with a shout, or with a loud command, and the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. You see, the Thessalonians were saying, well, you know, we believe in Jesus, but what happens if we die and he hasn't come back yet? Will we not reign with Jesus? And he's writing saying, no, no, no. The people who died are going to be resurrected when Jesus comes back. And he says, and after they they have been raised, he says, after that, we who are still alive, when the dead rise first, and we who are alive and left, we're walking on planet Earth, we will be caught up. That word caught up is where the word rapture comes from. In the Latin Vulgate, it reads, be caught up together, no, it reads, raptured in the clouds. We'll be raptured. We'll be caught up, taken up out of this world to meet the Lord in the air. And we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Wow. That's why in Titus, book of Titus, it says, while we wait for the blessed hope. This is our blessed hope. Jesus is coming back. And that's all part of the family. He's not leaving us behind. He's coming back for us. You see, uh, another trait that John mentions here is you act like the family. While we are on the way, I've been born again, slapped with new faith. I am walking on the way. Well, I act like the family while I am on this journey. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Here is the law of the Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Summed up in those two statements. You do those two things, you will fulfill the law. You can take all the commandments of God and they fall under the category of one or the other. Either it falls under the category of loving the Lord your God or it falls under the category of loving your neighbor as yourself. The whole law. Everyone who sins breaks the law. and That's that's why I, I was born a sinner and I sinned. I broke the law. I broke God's law. You broke God's law. We're all sinners. All have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. But you know that he appeared so that we, or he might take away our sins. There I was. I had a dark heart, a black heart. And he came that he might take away my sin and give me a new heart. That's what happened. I was born again. I believed in Jesus. He washed away my sins. He forgave me. He pardoned me. He justified me. All these things, I end up, uh, when he comes back for me, I'm glorified. Wow, all of this is in that salvation of his. That he might take away our sins. And and watch what it says. And in him is no sin. Jesus has no sin in him. That's why we celebrate Christmas. The virgin conception of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was conceived in such a way that he had no sin. In fact, this passage says there was no sin in him. In Peter, it says he did no sin. And also, in first, uh, 2 Corinthians, it says he knew no sin. There is no sin associated with him. 
He is, quote, the spotless Lamb of God. So he had no sin, but he took our sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so once we have him as our Savior, we are going to plug our lives into him. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. You can't be plugged into him and have a black heart. You can't. You cannot just keep on sinning. And the idea here is habitually. You've got to remember in 1 John chapter 1, he said, if anyone says he, is, he does not sin, he's a liar and the truth is not in him. So you can't say that I'm sinless, per perfect, perfectly sinless, because I'd be lying. But he says, on the other hand, you just cannot keep on sinning habitually. You cannot just always be sinning and say, well, that's okay. I mean, the Lord's forgiven me of my sins. And you, do you know what we would say today? You can't live like the devil and say that you're a Christian. You can't. No one who continues to sin, no one who continues to habitually sin, the tense here is that you, you are constantly doing this, has either seen him or known him. You have no associate with him. Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew, there's going to be many on that day say, oh Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do all these wonderful things in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. You can, be, you can pretend to have been born again. You can pretend uh, that you have faith. And you can prepent, pretend to be on the way. And, and at the end, there's going to be a reckoning when he's going to say, uh, depart from me, I never knew you. I never knew you. You have to legitimately accept, genuinely receive Christ as your Savior. And Because if you do, it says, if any man is in Christ, a believer in Christ. He is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And that doesn't mean I don't ever sin. Yes, I stumble and I fall into sin probably every day, but I don't make it a habit. I don't, I don't make a provision for myself to fall, and I don't do it constantly. He says, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning habitually. And no one who continues to habitually sin has either seen him or known him because we are new creatures in Christ Jesus. He said, dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. Don't get led astray. Don't let somebody tell you, oh, that's okay. Hey, everybody's doing this. And you know down, downright that that's wrong. You know in your heart the Holy Spirit's convicting you this is wrong, but peer pressure or something, is, is some other ulterior motive is telling you, go ahead and do it because... Ugh. And it comes down to simple things like lying. Lying. Oh, everybody, everybody is cheating in this way on taxes. Everybody is. I mean, oh, don't worry about it. They're, they're, you're not going to get caught. No, no, he says, dear children, don't let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous. That's all it means. You've done right. Just as he is righteous. So while I'm on the way, I've been born again. I believe in Jesus. I'm on the way. I want to do what is right and so purify myself. Purify myself because I'm on that journey. He who does what is sinful is of the devil. He's talking about he who does what is sinful habitually. You're, you're trapped in a sin and you can't get out. He says, hey, he is of the devil. Because the devil is the father of this whole thing. He says, because the devil has been sinning from the very beginning. And the reason the Son of God appeared was to, was to do away or destroy the devil's work. That's why Jesus came into the world. Now, now, there's several reasons why he came into the world, and this is one of them, to destroy the devil's work. And so when, when you accept Christ and you believe and you're on the way, you're wanting to have a life that has destroyed the work of the devil in your life. It should not be taking and controlling you. No one who is born of God will continue to sin. And what he means here is to sin habitually. You just won't keep doing it over and over and over and over and over. Why not? Why won't that person do that? Well, there's good reason. It's because God's seed remains in him. When you were born again, watch this, the text says, you were born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed by the word of God, which liveth and abides forever. Wow. The Holy Spirit infused life in me. 
because the word of God was preached. At that moment, I'm slapped with a whole whole new breath, breath of life and repentance, and I turn from all of that. He says he cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God from this incorruptible seed, the word of God. I don't believe anyone comes to Christ without the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why we got to share our faith. That's why we send missionaries around the world. He says, listen, you reveal your family traits of being born again by the fact that he does not keep on sinning. He does not go on sinning habitually. Your life is changed. I just find it amazing when a person accepts Christ, really genuinely accepts Christ, the life is so radically changed, people ask, what happened to you? My cousin was a truck driver. Now, truck drivers got a reputation of having some pretty foul mouths. He was the king. <laughs> he went to uh, a promise keeper movement back in the time, all right? Promise keeper movement. He was so moved, accepted Christ. He said the first thing that left him was his mouth was cleaned up. He didn't even tell dirty jokes anymore. And he said, he said, all these other truck drivers that knew him said, Kenny, what happened to you? What, did you get religion? You see, they knew immediately. Christians live differently. He said, I, I didn't try to do that. That just happened. Changed from the inside out. What happened? Born again. Hit with a new faith. Wow. On a new path. Man. The goal, Jesus, going to take me. I'll have glorified just like him. While I'm on the way, I'm a new creature. The old junk, I'm leaving it behind. I'm, I, I'm following Jesus and my life is being radically changed. Wow. So you reveal these family traits. This is how we know who are the children of God. Who? You look into the mirror of the Word of God and the Word of God, you, it reflects back and you say, wow, Jesus is changing my life. I'm not the person I used to be. I look more like Jesus. No, I'm not perfectly like Jesus, but I have a family resemblance there. Uh, I reveal the family traits of Jesus in Christians. And he says, and we know who are the children of the devil. Because they reveal the traits of Satan. The liar, the murderer, the deceiver, the self-centered one. But you reveal one or the other. It's something. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God. If you're not doing, the whole idea of right here is righteous. I'm not following the righteous leader, Jesus. I'm doing what is wrong. I'm not doing what is right. He says, no, you're following. You're showing the, the traits of the devil. And he goes on, he says, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. This is a big theme in the book of 1 John. We love other Christians. You get the word love. I'm not talking about tolerating, putting up with. He's talking about love. Later he's going to say that uh, so much so that you're willing to give your life for the brother. Whoa. Now that's love. That's loving like Jesus loved. He gave his life for us. He really loves his brother. Listen, anyone who does not love his brother is not of God, but he's of the devil. We don't want to be acting and showing the traits of the devil if I'm on the path that leads to glorification. I just don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Here's the point of all of this. You can't hide your family traits. You see them, and other people see them too. You see them, and other people see them too. So what do we learn from all of this today? What is John teaching us? Well, he's teaching us we must be born again to be in the family of God. You've got to be born again to have a second family. You can have your earthly family, but you want your heavenly family too. If you've not been born again, you only have an earthly family. That's it. That's it. So you need to be born again. The second thing I notice here is our family traits show up in us. They show up in how we act. We begin to act like Jesus because we're new creatures in Christ. 
We begin to look like Him too. People notice it and they say, wow, what, why are you so different? What's, what's happened? What happened in your life? And you get to tell them about Jesus. It shows up also how we love. We start loving other people like Jesus loved the people. Jesus loved people. And we need to love them too. Yeah, you say, but you don't know the guy I work with. <laughs> Jesus loved him too. Jesus loved him too. We need to love people. We need to love people. And so my summation of all is this, is that you need to make him your savior. You need to believe in him. And you need to make him your Lord. You need to live, live the way for him. You need to live for him. And you can do that today. If you've never called on the name of the Lord to save you, you can do that when we pray. It's very simple. You just say, Lord, I am a sinner. I need you as my Savior. I've only been in the, an earthly family. Lord, I want to be part of the heavenly family too. If you express genuine faith, it's only because the Holy Spirit birthed you. <laughs> he prompted you to do that. If you pray that sincerely in your heart, it's because he infused life in you and brought you into the family of God. Wow. You can do that right now while we pray. Let's bow. Lord, there's someone here who's saying, you know, I'm not sure that I'm in two families. They're doing an evaluation of themselves and saying, Lord, I, I think I only have a physical family. I don't have the spiritual family. I pray right now that they would just call out on you like we said. And they would just say these words, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need you to save me. I want to be in the family of God, so save me, oh God. I realize Jesus died on the cross, paid in full the debt of my sin, and he was buried. He buried my sin. He arose from the dead so that I might be in the family of God. I accept him as Savior, and I now make him my Lord. I will live for him. Lord, I know anyone who prays anything close to that, but means it in their heart. And Lord, you will save them. You will save them. You will change them from the inside out. You will work within them so the things that they used to love, they don't love anymore. The old is gone. The things they thought they'd never love, they love now. The Word of God, the church, people, uh, Lord, the, the preaching of your word, singing praise to you, it, it'll all change in their lives. And Lord, some of us who have accepted Christ as Savior and we've been born again, we've not been displaying our family traits and today we need to say, Lord, help me throw off those traits of the devil and manifest the traits of the Spirit of God and Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of my sins, O God. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I look forward to the day when the journey is over and you call me home and I hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enable us, Lord, to stay on that path the way Persevere to the end and hear Jesus say it, well done. This I pray in Jesus' name, amen.